Righty, we are back with show number eight. Jail, what's good? What's good? Welcome back, man. Holy crap. Another yeah. episode of Nick and Justin show. Yes, yes, yes. I got I got some spicy topics this week. I don't know about my spicy, mine's thoughtful. <laughs> thoughtful? Okay, okay. So that means that this episode would be spicy and thoughtful. Thoughtfully spicy. Ooh, Ooh I like that one. That should be our uh our title thoughtfully spicy episode there we go okay <laughs> give me give me some of your thoughtful topics all right does your work environment affect your productivity okay and then the quote again i'm pondering on if you if you want to go fast go alone and if you want to go far go together so those are my two thoughtful topics okay my two topics for this episode the first one there's a youtube channel that i spotted at 20,000 subs within the past six days, they've gone up to 77,000. And I truly think they'll definitely get really, really big, really, really fast. And we could break down exactly what channel that is and why. And then the other topic is buying the Apple Vision Pro better than buying a index stock. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Hmm. I want to go with the re YouTube breakdown only because we kind of started it and I'm kind of nerding out on just the statistics of things and analytics okay so th there's this one channel they're called the sticks they're these australian creators that when i first found them they were at twenty one thousand subscribers in the past six days they're now at seventy seven thousand five hundred subscribers now this well, right now hold on as of right now today's date of recording is june 11th correct 2023 so if this comes out a little bit later so this is our date of that we're analyzing this page yeah and so the high level there it's these two australian creators they created their channel back in 2016 so this isn't something like a like an overnight success these guys have definitely been grinding away at it for a couple of years but there's a couple of things that they're they're doing that i think makes it very interesting and why i think they're catching fire today mm -hmm. so do you remember arax um do you know who Eric is as as a Yeah, I remember I seeing this isn't that the one that kind of was it snuck into Dan Bazilian like party and so yeah, it's like this is some like impossible task, get it done type of guy, like YouTuber. Exactly. So he yeah. did a bunch of these crazy things along the way, right? Like he sold Logan Paul's sofa couch, or he put a boat in Logan Paul's pool, or like all of these crazy things. But his channel had an overarching story that allowed individuals to tie into his thing was I will hit a million view, uh, a million subscribers within one year. And so you're like watching him make these crazy videos, but along that, that journey of getting to a million subscribers within that first year. And so I think these guys are doing something very, very similar. Their high level, like goal or journey is they want to create, biographies for youtube creators and they will do it until they get to do mr beast's biography and so they started the journey two creators ago let's say mm -hmm. they created one for Iraq. they you know documented okay this is how we're going to create it we're going to find lookalikes of him we're going to tell his story we got to figure out how to get it in front of him things like that that one did kind of decent, but like they, they built connections off of it. The one that I ended up seeing them was when they did it for Ryan Trahan and they, you know, okay, we're going to create this thing. We might have to fly out to the United States from Australia. Is he going to respond? How do we even get in touch with him? Right. You're seeing the journey of like how he's going to do all of these different things. And so they end up creating a video with him and, and getting that, you know, completed. That's the one that started going viral. Right. And now they're looking for who's that next creator. That's one more degree closer to Mr. Beast, right. In order for them to kind of mm -hmm. move upon that journey of getting to the point of getting to Mr. Beast. And there's, there's three things that I think that like really stand out on like why I think these guys would be su successful. One, they have the skills, right? Like they know how to create compelling videos with a really good storyline. Right. So there's like this overarching story of we're, going to share this journey of where we're getting at. But then within each of their videos, it's it's super meta. Each of their videos has to have a storyline. But then each of the videos that they're creating for the video creators also has a storyline. 
right? So it's it, it's super meta. So it's, dual, it's two it's two storylines in one video, and just behind the scenes on top of it, the video itself. Exactly. So there's there's a lot of layers that you can kind of like follow. Their videos are kind of evergreen. If you kind of want to go back and read, you know, view another video, so it's not like a point in time thing. Um, so I, I think that's a, a very important aspect of all of this. The so that's kind of like one and two, right? Skill sets, having a defined journey and storyline. The last one is audience jacking. And so mm-hmm. this is something that Eric did really, really well was like, I'm going to do this for Dan Belzerian. You don't know who Eric is, but you know who Dan Belzerian is. I'm going to do this with Logan Paul. I don't know who Eric is, but I do know who Logan Paul is. And so these guys are doing the same thing. I don't know who these guys are that call themselves the sticks out of Australia, but I do know Ryan Trahan and I do know Eric. Right. And I do know Mr. Beast. And so they're building off the credibility of all these other creators along their journey that also lends them that kind of like social proof and capital to keep that ball moving. And so, no, I'll, like I'll, I'll leave it it's, there. <laughs> it's, oh my God. I think I, I want to say it was like Chris Williamson. I think he might have said it. All of a sudden, his podcast was blowing up. And there's, there's, this was during COVID. Like he started in 20. When we caught him, it was very low level, 2020. And I think he was the one that coined the Dream 100. I'm not sure. I need to fact check it. But the Dream 100 is interviewing, again, the top of your your favorite people, but the top people that go get eyes on it. And that's what Eric did. The Sticks are doing. It's they don't. They're they're leveraging this name, their name of their guest to get eyes on theirs and it's freaking and they're doing it in like a higher level not just like oh can you be on my show but we'll give you something as like this dope storyline that you can enjoy and be collaborative on it's pretty crazy yeah i think everyone would be flattered to have someone come up and be like hey i created a video about your life what wait what what did you do (laughs) yeah you're like i'm not steve jobs well why are you doing this first of all but i'm looking at it right now so i'm just breaking down their first video so they started in 2016 uh, that's when they first started the channel. Um, the first video came out four years ago, so 2019. Um, or at least the first video that didn't get archived. Correct. The first video that didn't get archived. So the active videos right now I'm looking at, majority pumped out, let's say, about 12 last year. But this year is interesting because they only had um, four videos so far. One about AI, but the most recent four and they're spread out between three to four months. So they're really diving in in the quality versus just outputting just content on the daily basis. So it's it's also a different type of approach, which is insane because what we're just, every week we're putting something out. That's what we're doing. They're, do, they're just, we're going to do a very thoughtful story, make it really, really good, and then boom. So as of right now, their pacing is about four videos a year, but it's going to hit pretty crazy. And here's one other thing being that you're on their site right now. How many yeah. subscribers did they have right now? 77,700. So it's gone up by 200 just since I started prepping for this two hours ago. <laughs> just, <laughs> just wanted to let you know, like I saw that right when I clicked it right now and I was like, Oh, that, that number, my number is already not accurate. God dang. But no, but I love, I love the fact that they, they, they're not, they're not new. They didn't pop up. They've been doing these things. It's it's crazy just to see how much they are starting to gain traction after putting so much work in now. Like from, from the working in the past and then how it's just kind of now investing in everything now. So that's, that is a grind. It's holy crap. I'm just fine-tuning so many skill sets, storytelling, editing. It's a lot of nuances that now, oh yeah, I'm really going to show my shit. That's pretty nuts. Yeah, so I I would definitely if you haven't had a chance to look at their video, watch this video after our our pod. It's it's really good, dude. <laughs> I, it also helps that I'm a fan of the creators that they're making these mm-hmm. videos for. So there's that. I mean, there there's that social audience jacking, right? Is there's that tie in? But yeah, some of the older stuff not really interested as much. But yeah, they're they're recent stuff definitely. Yeah. So, and now it's also repivoting on the current content. Oh, what's not working? Right, repivot to something else. It's no way acknowledging. You can always say, "Hey, I'm gonna keep doing this, and hopefully something hits." But it's like, "Hey, something not working. We gotta just pivot." And that's pretty crazy. 
Yeah, and it's just it, there's these two guys that like it's it's one thing to kind of keep going by yourself, right? But they're mm-hmm. doing it as a partnership, still being able to go through all the like ups and downs that's involved with it as well. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Colin and Samir. I don't know if you follow them either, but you, well, okay. So like way back when they were just like recording basically a podcast in their car, they had to take kind of like a hiatus of where like they both moved and kind of were going to give up the idea and dream. And then they like came back and they were like, okay, no, let's give it another try kind of thing. So yeah, you just eat persistence. You have to be persistent. <laughs> And eventually oh, it might yeah. happen or may never happen. But, you know, you, you'll never know if you don't have that persistence to begin with. It's just insane about even us, just our, our little goals. When you're just looking down at our these small little analytics. Oh, we got like another hour view. This is crazy. It just the persistency of it, it's like, crap, we're doing this from afar or we're doing it. We have to just put time in every week and how we're going to move our projects and move around and make this happen and keep it consistent. It. it Going back to last week, it just seems like a whole different type of story. Having one consistent thing just gets a snowball effect on other, of all of our else's lives. So it's pretty, but no, I think it's just sticking to it. It's just seeing this right now. I'm probably de- definitely going to look in on these, um, on these videos after this pod, but it is interesting just to dissect that aspect. It's just the little nuances of, man, these guys just came up. No, they've been doing hella work right now. It's not discredit all that oh they're just doing all they're putting in hella work right now so uh it's, it's actually really exciting to watch yep and, and also wanted to throw this up on the pod that way we can call out we saw them at the early days where they were <laughs> like multi-million sub type of people um so shout out to the sticks crew and uh best of luck on on their journey Ooh. yeah i want to pivot to my topic then if we're talking about partnership and how you talk about Colin Samir and the sticks then. So to the comment that the thing I was thinking about, that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And to me, that had so many layers to it. You can think about partnership. You can think about friendship, work, life. It's not just business. I, to me, I had a lot of levels. So I kind of want to hear your thoughts first before I dive in to on, going on top of talking about sticks, Colin Samir and all that jazz so your thoughts say the quote one more time if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together statement almost implies that you can't go fast and far Mm -hmm. i think there's some speed in going by yourself because you can eliminate some of the decision making the discussions things like that that's required but i think that's more of a that would be a preferred way to go if you don't have the ability to align with a partner if you could align with a partner, you could still keep that speed up, right? Like you just have to have the priorities aligned in a way that allows any kind of friction that slows that thing down um, to be eliminated. I agree that you can go further with someone else because you guys get to lean on each other of, hey, I may not be feeling at my 100, that other person can kind of lean in, pick up the slack a little bit. Right. And then you could go vice versa. And then when both of the team members are kind of like feeling a little bit down, you guys could just have that like candid one on one talk. You don't feel like you're a little like in a little echo chamber of just yourself and your own head and trying to figure things out. Um, so I think overall, I think I agree with the quote. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts with that I, quote? I, I thought of multiple levels, thought about us again, partner, my sibling, other, but mainly just in the business terms of even for me deconstructing my own self, it's, it's been hard. I, dissecting us, I think a certain point, I move slower than you. So it's me picking up my pace on that, but going together, I couldn't break down the shorts on how you break down the, the long form to short form edits. That's too much time. And sometimes for you, for me, it's the long-term edits that you need to generate the shorts. So that's the one we kind of move together. And us too, we have produced more content that we did in, probably two to three months than we did we're say we're going to do in a year <laughs> on Absolutely. our own individual projects so for sure going far together was a big help but then if you take down the second layer let's say how about i'm going to bring back a book i think i talked about it before was the rich dad poor dad second book the cash flow quadrant and what makes a self-employee like self-business versus a real like a business enterprise type of business and it's relinquishing control and that's when i thought about 
want to go together. It's telling myself that I cannot do everything and I can, I have to outsource the things that take too much time to think of the higher level things. So outside, then it pulled another layer of this project. Holy crap. I, instead of relying on you, I got to rely on the other, let's say fivers, if we're going to bring in or edit or anything else that we have to think about doing, that is a hard thing for even someone or anyone else to say, I got to, I got to take my pride out of it and just keep on moving. So that's why this quote kind of just stood out to me because I'm just going into this life scenario of, yes, it's easy to say to relinquish control, but can you like, can the one person, this is when, if you're a significant other that loves to drive or you would just want to drive and they don't. So can you relinquish that control? So you both can drive because my partner loves driving and I normally like driving as well. So I drive, everywhere for the year for the first year and she's like hey I, I like driving too can i drive and i was like yeah okay but optically it's one of the significant others you'd be driving it took me it's like, okay it's okay to say hey this is not a it's fine it is what it is just get your shit out of it drive and be a partnership this is a partnership now it's like all right cool like we're so yeah that that was an interesting thought so that, those are mine i think i think it's valid to try to hold on control Especially mm -hmm. if you either A, haven't experienced the ability to share responsibilities before, or B, you've tried it and been burned. Yeah. Right? Because it makes you a little bit more hesitant to try it again. Um, but it's one of those things that you typically find has a lot more upside than downside once you try it. Yeah. So whether we're thinking about it from this podcast standpoint, e like one of us individually can only get so much done us together can get let's say twice as much done but as we continue to go with others on this right expand our team now we have five people six people seven people the amount of stuff that we can get done is is going to be exponential compared to what we could do as an individual i guess it's more linear but i'm sure there's some synergies that make it exponential Oh um, yeah. I still I still believe we can also go fast together, but everyone has to be on the same page. Let's get let's get going. I mean, so it's a really good point. Today, dude, I felt like crap this weekend, right? Like I was sleeping all day yesterday when I got the text message about us recording for this. And it's so easy to just be like, hey, I feel terrible. We we can't record. But then also, if I took a step back, I'm like, no, we have this goal and vision of getting somewhere where we're busy, both of us. We allocate certain amount of time on the weekends for this. And it kind of throws a wrench in everything else. If there's a last minute cancellation, reschedule, anything like that, it just really messes up the vibe, right? And so for me, it was really important to still be here because in order to maintain that momentum and continue to have that shared vision of where we want to get to it's that's me putting in my part even if it was i went to bed i was in bed probably about eight o'clock yesterday 8 30 yesterday and you know woke up got a little bit of prep work i'm probably gonna crash right after this podcast <laughs> but if i look at what the end result was it was completed we were able to meet we got we got we something done. done exactly oh <sighs> Yeah, just getting it. It's it's it sucks at the moment. It's I don't want to go to work. You get to work, you do it, you get the job done. Okay, fine. I feel pretty. I feel pretty good about my day. Or even just working out. You're like crap. I don't want to do this shit. And I work out. I feel great, even though I'm for sure gonna crash. But at least you can go home. Ah, I did it. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Any other any other uh, final thoughts on on that quote from, from no, your side? I can, I kind of want to move in on the. Uh, the Apple uh, Vision uh, product, okay. Vision Pro. So let's dive into this. Is buying an Apple Vision Pro a better investment than stocks? So here's the background on this. If we were to look at the first original iPhone, right? That iPhone 1 that came out in 2007. Marquise Brownlee, MKBHD, he did a video maybe a month ago where he went and tried to buy one, mint condition, he bought it for $40,000. So we're looking at a product that originally sold for $599. He bought it for $40,000 later. That's a huge 
amount of appreciation that came with that product. Now, this is obviously one of your alternative assets, right? This isn't your core asset that you're going to be looking to invest in, unless maybe you're the Dogecoin millionaire kind of model, but we also know how that ended out. Um, if you don't, take a look. Wasn't good. <laughs> um, so the the tweet that got me going on this was the chairman on Twitter. I don't know if you know who the chairman is, but that's Wall Street Bets, the chairman. Mm. He posted this this uh, tweet. Don't buy stocks for your retirement fund. Buy Apple Vision Pros. A factory-sealed iPhone 1 sold for $63,000 this year. 105x the original price. If an unopened Apple Vision Pro appreciated at the same rate, it would be worth nearly half a million dollars in 15 years. That's a $3,000 investment with an upside of a half a million dollars in 15 years, okay? To give you kind of a perspective of what that, well, what if I put $600 in the S&P 500 back in 2007, what would it be today? So if you put $600 into the S&P 500 in 2007, that would be $2,300 today. So it's still what, two and a half X, but mm -hmm. nowhere near the 105 X appreciation that was found in just that one iPhone. The $63,000 um, iPhone that he was talking about, that one sold a couple of months before Mark Reese Brownlee actually bought his. So um, that one was sold in February, 2023. And the ones that were sold a little bit after kind of teared off a little bit. It was like, I think the next one was 40, like 50 something thousand. The next one underneath that one was then Mark Reese Brownlee's 40 something thousand dollar one. So it's, you know, again, back to that, that quick money, but also having to be lucky. The product that you buy, it's buying trading cards, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to buy this person's rookie. That. Yep. I'm going to buy this person's rookie that. card. Are it's they going to be collectible? good? Is it what it is? It's just a collect, it's just a collectible market. It's not saying it's a stock or crap. You have cars who back in the day of Toyota forerunner was a dime a dozen or a Jeep Cherokee XJ was a thousand dollars or $500 used for X amount. But you have the, the value of overlanding now and all these car bills that created a higher demand for it and with a lack of supply. Same thing. You have all these, for me, that's why the reason I got, kind of got into magic cards. It's just a fun little thing of one. I thought the art was dope Two, I thought it was easy to play with my brother and I'll collect stuff. Honestly, I bought the Lord of the Rings box booster box set for magic. Uh, when it came out last week, I was like 2 AM like, Oh shit. It came out. The pre-orders came out. I bought it silly is like $200 effort. I, I don't know from it. I was going to save a couple packs, open them. Hopefully I get that one ring, the rarest card of the bunch. Now, but, are you going to open those packs because like you want to see if you find what's in there or are you going to hold on to those packs, leave them unopened with this potential upside that that one pack can appreciate? Might have. Oh yeah. I already have it planned out. Ideally, if I wanted, if I had extra money, this is again, fun money that I have budgeted away. I'm not just blowing things to blow things like, no, if ideally what about two? hold one box set mint, I would have bought, I would have opened the second box, keep up, keep separate packets, which I'm going to do for this one, like at least five packets unopened and then open the rest and see what I get. What if you get nothing in those packets that you do open? Yeah, fuck, fucking hey, that's the game. So you're not going to open up the other one still? No. And the reason is because you think that those will um, appreciate over time? Yeah. There's, it's weird because just small YouTube videos or shorts. And since the damn explore pages found out, I'm looking at trading cards. So I have to get all the content coming in. Some of the packets of like a legendary, like higher end series sell more than individual cards itself. Just oh, wow. of the what ifs. And keeping the package. Yeah, I mean, people were doing that with Pokemon cards recently, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm starting to see. It And Magic, what I love about Magic, it's that it's the same thing as tech and the way they structured it. Magic's been on for 30 years. The game is overly, always changing, different series of games. The way that they play, you have to buy new cards. They keep, they keep tabs on what cards are deemed illegal or banned or... It's it's a pretty evolving game that's still for thirty years and it never got old. That still has a cult following. Yeah, I might I got into it. Never thought I would, 
But for Pokemon, there was so much ebb and flows to it. It got it died out. It came back. Magic always stayed steady, and this we never never been open to it. Same thing for tech. You never thought back in the nineties, tech, old tech, like Apple One computer, like the very first one, would have be in, in a museum. Who would have thought but of like, it now? If you don't know that they're going to be at that point, do you think it's worth just kind of like making a purchase with the potential of that being a thing, or do you buy it to actually enjoy it? And then if there's value to it later, you're like, oh, maybe I have one. That's a hard part. You know, you don't know. Right. I mean, think about these Apple Vision Pros. So for for anyone listening it, that hasn't seen them yet, it's basically Ready Player One kind of esque, um, mm-hmm. but made by Apple. I think it's the power of the brand. It's so far going to stay true. If Apple could still be a lifetime brand and hold on again, it could be like GE and fall off. Yeah. Do, do, do people, I didn't know this a couple years ago, but who's GE's like founder? I mean, is this a pop quiz for me or is this the pop, pop quiz, quiz for you? For, pop quiz for okay. you to answer for everybody else. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Edison. <laughs> there it is. But it's, it's George Washington. I did not, I didn't know that. But if you knew, oh, the creator of light bulb was GE and they marketed towards that. And that could have been a different story. You never know. It so as been. long as if Apple her like kept keeps their story and keeps their quality and keeps their brand, then yeah, it could be a smarter like Jordan's still strong. He did he retired way back when it's still going strong. So it's when you buy a Nike shirt that's still from like a, a two Hanes shirt, but you put freaking put Nike on it or Supreme on it, it's gonna elevate that shirt. It's just the power of the brand. So if Apple stays strong, then yeah, buy it, buy two, leave one in mint and then <laughs> And, and then mess around with the product or just keep it and see what happens. Just, it, I think it's just the power of the company in overall terms. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And and for the record, it's it's Thomas Edison, by the way, for the, the founder of GE. <laughs> I, I threw a bunch of names out there. I just wanted to close the loop on that one. Um, Are you gonna, you're really going to leave them out like that? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely did not want to do that. J.O., do you know how much money Magic the Gathering actually made, let's say, in 2022? No, I did not. $1.1 billion. I think it for sure got my money to 2023. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> Closing the loop on, on the Apple piece. Would you buy it and hold it thinking they'll appreciate? I would buy it, but not in the sense of making it mint. I'll actually use it. But actually hold on to it long term, not just, oh, it's a, it's it's tech and toss, which I've done in the past. It was like an N64 that, oh, fine, I don't need it in my, I don't need it in my closet. Sold it. Regret it. All these old games. Yes. Instantly regret it. Like I sold Resident Resident Evil 2 PlayStation 1. Regretted it. So regardless if it's not, so like you get the the Vision Pros, they're still going to hold value if you hold on to it and it slowly phases out. And now you just toss cards, but if you keep it in a good condition, then yeah, it's still going to have value. Maybe not as a mint, but I would would mess around with it because it looks super sick. I think I'm going to try to buy one and just leave it mint. (laughs) Damn you. That way, when you have yours in 15 years used, I can let you know how much the other one is unused. Why don't you just buy two? Because that's $6,000 plus all the taxes and stuff. Maybe if I go down to wash, uh, Oregon to avoid the sales tax. I did not say that. Um, Yeah. Yeah, you did. We have that, it on the pod. I don't know if I want to. I'm so hesitant. Okay, so like Apple iPad 1. That mm-hmm. thing was a brick. And I don't think it's worth, I don't even know what that one's worth unopened, but that was like the first iPad that came out. iPad 2 came out super thin, way, like everything about it was just leagues better, right? And so from like a a user standpoint, I would probably buy this first one, leave it mint, hold it. Second one comes out, buy it and use it. But then there's the, the other layer on top of this. Think about like the PS4s when they came out. Everyone was just buying them to resell them and it just messed up the entire market. What if because now everyone sees what had happened with the iPhone, people go into the Vision Pros with that same thing where everyone's just buying and holding it. It's going to have a saturated market in 15 years. It's not going to be worth anything anyways. It's it's just that gamble that you're taking with collectibles, right? I think once you start talking about it like that, even for me, I probably, I think you're too late to the show. So I shouldn't do it. Dude, just get it and we'll work together and we'll be in we'll be in a in Ready Player One lobby, like just chilling. Mm. This is when you gotta have just money on the side where you're like, ah, I don't care. I'm gonna put this into a lockbox and 
put it in a time Not, capsule and I'll come see what happens with any of this stuff me, in the time capsule. Let me put years. this in a warehouse, nice protected, and let's see what happens in the next 10 years. Yeah, basically. It's a it's a dice roll. Well, it's what it is. It's always collectibles are is it worth it? Is it not? Like even we speak about magic and how that's gonna get hyped, is it is it not? You know, like for the Lord of the Rings, the only reason why I bought it, it's like crap, they never really I think they did it one time, but they didn't do so well, so they're redoing it, and it looks super sick. That one's super niche. Yeah, and that's why Lord of the Rings have a crazy following. It's timeless. Crap, might as well. Okay, so clicking back, we discussed how the two individuals in Australia, the Sticks, they were able to work towards something together. We tie that into how does goals, basically, can, how far can you get as an individual versus doing something together with somebody? But how does your productivity or your overall success impacted by the environment that you work in? All right. So back on the quote that we talked about, or not quote, but study I saw. So Northwestern Business uh, Business School did a little study and saying, in your work environment, depending on your 25-foot radius, if you're with a high performer or a low performer, that will your productivity will either increase or decrease by 15%. So with that being said, let's just take out, let's talk about a person's environment. Holy crap, what does that mean? Is it, does it really matter if your environment really does affect you? So I think that's the overall question. So for, for you to think about with your thoughts first, do you think that's true? Do you think is it the people that you generally surround yourself in your life? I think looking at the study, they're specifically looking at in-office experience, right? That's why they're looking at it within a certain radius of where you mm -hmm. work and who are you engaging with. For us, we work kind of remotely or somewhat semi-remotely. So probably the way to look at that would be who are you engaging with on a consistent basis because that becomes your work environment. So either of the either of the two, it comes down to the individuals in your environment and kind of looking at that, like it, it reminds me a lot of that topic or the quote that we've said before, you are the average of the five individuals you hang out with the most. And, and for a lot of individuals, people that they hang out with the most will be their coworkers. And so if you're around a bunch of individuals that are high performers, in most cases, they're going to bring you up. If you're one of the individuals, that's probably the, the higher performer. And that group's going to end up bringing you down, but by default, you'll bring them up ideally a little bit. And so in each of those groups, it kind of depends who's the air quote toxic one and who's the air quote pro like productive one in, in that area. Cause not everyone's going to be, you know, at the same level. So someone is going to be pulling and someone's going to be pushing kind of uh, the group forward or a little bit backwards to creating that average. Going back to the general question, does workplace matter? Absolutely. Absolutely matters. And I think that goes back to even one of the topics we talked about in our first episode and why we even started doing this. I was up here living on a little island in Seattle, not actually a little island, a little more, you know, metaphoric island, but I was going was crazy. <laughs> yeah, I was going crazy. I didn't have the individuals to talk different ideas about or you know go back and forth with things where it was just me in my own head trying to figure things out and when i was able to expand that group and actually start having conversations about things again i found myself to be more productive and i would probably say i'm a very efficient productive individual but without some of those other pieces there i kind of went stir crazy and was starting to go in circles snap Same. What about you? What, what what are your thoughts when it comes to productivity mm -hmm. and the environment around you? So I thought of it in two point of views, like at work, because we still have to go in office. I 100% agree. I feel like I'm in office of three and we're all very strong and we're really good on picking up each other's weaknesses. So with that, yeah, I felt like my productivity as a whole, not just like outputs, let's just say like soft skills has helped me. One's a little bit more patient. I am not. Imp I am very impatient sometimes when I need to get stuff done. So he rubbed off on mine. I'm more OCD, clinically detailed, and we just had talk shops. And he his clinical skill set has been increasing as well, and I've been noticing it. So it goes both ways, especially with my boss that comes in the office here and there. Like he works in, he roams around our three different facilities, and just having him around elevates my skill set because like, crap I got to be that that level but 
I also thought of it as I already have this drive to get better, but it wasn't, it was, it was more energy draining on my end to say, I have to be self-involved. When I worked by myself, like in a high school, you're just, you're for sure on an Island, no talk shops, no one else to bounce ideas off of being by yourself. It, it, it was more draining mentally, physically, just to get, I gotta, I gotta learn more. I gotta do more than having the osmosis effect where you're just having things and you just kind of their energy kind of matches yours and they boost you up. So I thought of it as two point of views is that I don't think an individual is saying, Hey, they can't be good on their own, but it is draining. Kind of reminds me of the different types of motivation. It could be push motivated or pull, mo- pull motivated when you're by yourself. It's a lot of push motivation, right? Mm-hmm. Like you are the one that has to initiate to create that momentum. When you have other individuals around you that, in a way can bring you up. It's a little bit of a pull motivation, right? You're not the one that's solely responsible for kind of keeping that momentum going because you see these other individuals around you where you kind of almost feel pulled towards, towards that higher efficiency, productivity, output, ideas, all of that kind of stuff. I think that that's what kind of triggered in my mind when, when you said that last statement. Yeah. I think even even though you're indirectly, you're not even working them directly, you're just kind of observing. Let's just say for, wow, they called 10 clients and I only called five. We're in the same exact environment. What's going on with me? And then you just learn by, you learn by watching sometimes. And let's just say like, maybe he's not on his phone for an additional 10 minutes or something. Then they're able to pop off the calls. Um, when I read this, I kind of thought about the pursuit of happiness. When there's a call, like I can optimize my calls if I don't drink water or do something that makes me not go to the bathroom three times, maybe twice a day. And that will give me at least a five extra more calls. And we watch them like crap. And let's just say you're just a third party, just observing this guy. And you're like, huh, maybe that's why it does more calls than me. It's, it's just, it's, you don't know the person, but you just watch. And that's where you're like, oh crap where I feel like the osmosis effect kicks in on for this study. I think with some of those things that you had talked about, it almost reminds me also is you're able to find out, like if you're on your own own little island, in most cases, you're going to try to work harder. Mm-hmm. When you have other individuals that are a little bit higher performing, they unlock the ability to sometimes work smarter. And that's where like the, the true unlocking is, is because you can try to go harder to just try to get that same output or you find shortcuts and ways to become more efficient yeah what was so my boss would pick his brain very high like very high like iq of in the clinical setting something i would do in three steps you do in one i was like crap so yeah they had efficiency based flink i know what i'm doing just kind of watch and learn that there's the term watching and learning a lot of people just don't have that i feel like they don't i feel like they have they, they know everything and probably it speaks when I hear my dad, when I say that, you, you feel like, you know, everything I'm like, crap, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> but then watching and just learning, even you just seeing how you operated when we lived together was totally different. Oh crap. There's a difference. So, huh? I, I think that's a great tie in on just everything right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, that's really good. Should we wrap it up or do you want to do uh, a no, check, you wrap check up. in? Should we do oh, a check-in check on some in? of our goals? Yeah, let's go check-in. Go ahead. Go ahead. Me first. Yeah, go for it. Um, so in the last pod, I have the goal of... Okay, so for the pod, I had to get some more things edited, finish our website. The edits, for the most part, are all done. The website, I forgot about it again. So <laughs> once again, that's on my list of things to do. Um, With regards to personal goals... The renovation is moving along. We were able to get an electrician in here to do all of the electrical work that was needed. And so we're going to be doing a lot of of the cosmetic things going forward. So like painting and fixing holes in the walls and that, that kind of thing. That person will be here probably in two weeks. So probably not a huge amount of progress to be made this week, but uh, in two weeks from now, it'll be more like, you know, going through everything and cleaning things up or, um, we'll, we'll pre-order a lot of the new fixtures and uh, different things that we need for that stuff. So all of that stuff can then be installed as soon as he's done. 
And I think that those are the two big things that were, that were on my plate. What about you, J.O.? I moved a little bit on some admin tasks on the podcast. It was just such a mess after actually digging into it after three years. I had so many documents separated. My pitch deck was super dated. So I finished a new pitch deck. I'm reaching out to creators. I know I said that last week, but dude, when I actually dug into everything, I'm like, everything was so out of date. Emails were everywhere on different accounts, nothing else. So I was like, I got to get organized. So that was, that kind of became the new pivot. But now I'm ready to actually get at least three to four. I'm reaching out three to four, ready to map them out. And now I just got to send the template. So I'm going to be doing that. That's goal one. Goal two, get though my, get my website up because I've been saying that for the last half a year. But yeah, that that's for two. I'm not saying too many. I just wanted to focus on one, two things and get this shit done. Okay. So prioritizing those couple of things, what's, what's yeah. your P0? What do you mean P0? What's your priority zero? What's your, your first item? First item is to reach out to a guest. That's P0. Okay. P1, I would say. Why it's P, 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 P1. P1 is, yeah, it's a priority, but P0, is, it's on fire. This is the one that needs to get done. Oh yeah. P0 needs to get, I need to get, I need to get content going. So I need to get some guests lined up. Okay. And then P1? Website. P2? That's it. That's all I got right now. Okay. That's all you need. As so long as you as have as a priority as, of what it is. As long, as long as I got those two, only because I can't focus on too much because I get lost in sauce. And the next deliverable for this podcast is creating our SOP to do, to find Fivers or other editors to help us out with the show. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice to help out with some of the editing side. <laughs> well, so that's P0 for this. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, for everyone that has made it to this part of the show, we appreciate that you have made it and joined us again for another episode. We look forward to seeing you next week. And hopefully next week we'll have those websites so that you can actually check them out. I know, right? <laughs> so like, comment, subscribe, and we will see you in the next one. Peace.